Yes. So hello and uh, welcome to AI for predictive maintenance uh, seminar series. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, many of you already know, the RICE is organizing a seminar series with interesting ex external speaker every two weeks. And then, <clears throat> so I am hosting uh, this seminar series and my name is Madha Misra. And today we have a speaker from Volvo AB uh, and he is located in Gothenburg, Sweden. So Dr. Tawak Tehri, who is going to share his work on the topic of opportunity and challenges in prognostics and health management of crocs and buses. And uh, I would like to briefly introduce uh, about uh, Dr. Uh, Tahiri. Dr. Tahiri has been on three years active journey in Volvo AB in the area of prognostics and predictive maintenance in various role of a specialist in, and product owner. And uh, Dr. Tahiri got uh, his PhD from uh, University of Strasbourg on in ship machinery predictive maintenance and he also has uh, prior experience as both test engineer and quality manager in oil and gas and heavy industry system. And uh, the, the, the presentation will take around 40 to 45 minutes and then afterward we will have opportunity for question and answer. So now floor is your thought and uh, we are excited to listen to your so please go ahead and share your screen then now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll okay. I uh, hope you see my screen. Um I'll as yeah. I said, uh, I'll talk about the journey or generally predicting maintenance in Volvo. Yeah, my name is Atta Bakhtahiri, or you can call me Atta as well. Uh, as an introduction, I'll just say, uh, I'll start with a brief uh, background on predictive maintenance, and then it's uh, one, how it happened in Volvo, and then a little bit on business case, uh, why we're doing predictive maintenance in uh, truck and buses, and then a uh, uh, little bit about setup in Volvo, how it is, and then I'll go a little bit more details on... Um, uh, the, what methodology and components are we working on in the four different criteria, and base, I'll go a little bit more deeper on them, and then a little bit more other information, and then uh, a conclusion on some future work that I see that we will start, and also what well, always good to have collaborations. Um, so predictive maintenance here, well, we use as a more data-driven and proactive maintenance methodologies. So this is something that uh, we look on um, uh, how the condition of the equipment based on condition monitoring tools and uh, data achieved. So it is a data-driven approach. Um, and it's based on also the list of failure modes and uh, what we see. Uh, it is more obviously cost convenient and cost efficient. So I'll talk about that, but uh, also we can optimize the lifespan of equipments that's actually by monitoring them and uh, uh, and also before they compromise, so they predict before any failure. It is different than preventive, so I'll just explain the reasons, but um, you can see this is just a snap of some of the companies. You can see some companies are really spending a lot of time and money and effort on uh, using predictive. And that was 2016. That has changed a bit more. And uh, obviously, this is a very growing industry right now for the obvious reasons of having more data and uh, benefits of it. So in reality, predictive maintenance, the main, let's say, where we started from was uh, we started from corrective. Uh, maintenance or fix it when it's broken uh, or reactive, they said, maintenance. There are different names for it, but that's basically, as the word it says, when uh, it's based on a corrective action. So when you have a failure, you just correct it, fix it, a uh, uh, broken thing. However, obviously, this is a very costly thing to do, and it can be very dangerous as well, actually. And uh, it can have a big environmental and also uh, uh, you know, personal and uh, other impacts, like quite big impacts. 
in, in different, especially in oil and gas, that could be very dangerous. Then we have preventive. After that, we started having preventive maintenance, and this is based on uh, the knowledge of uh, generally lifespan of components and creating a more schedule based or periodic uh, preventive uh, schedules. And so we started having more perform uh, regular maintenance. So that's what, for example, in vehicles, we have oil change intervals or you know, we change uh, filters and so on. And uh, this is just a very common uh, service schedules that we know. Uh, so this is based on the preventive uh, uh, actions. But then this is the better version of that with available of the, well, in terms of things and also the data from achieved from the uh, whatever assets here, let's say vehicle, but any assets basically uh, we're looking into. And this is based on, we receive data and based on the previous knowledge and data analytics, uh, we create a model that can predict the lifespan and the state of health of, the, uh, uh, of or remaining useful life of the components. And then based on that, we create a, prediction that when it will fail and we try to do most optimized service plan based on that. So that means, uh, and this can be both ways. So if we have a main, uh, for example, in a preventive schedule, we can also update the preventive schedule. So for example, uh, we have a preventive schedule for filter change. However, we can predict that it's going to last longer. So that's actually cost saving, but in other cases, opposite. If it's going to fail before that schedule, that's also, well, in a very cost saving, but also even bigger, that's also breakdown avoidance as well. So this is the what predictive. And then on top of that, the future predictive will come into more prescriptive maintenance. So this is also, we prescribe actions to reduce the downtime. And also we can pr prescribe like, in a, for example, assets, uh, if, if you, if you have a, a fleet of vehicles, we can always prescribe it to re change the vehicle usages in within fleet. So some of the vehicles can last longer than others and using a different, like uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. So this is also more a uh, decision making part of predictive and looking more broader uh, term as well. Um, and then here, the reasons, obviously, what I mentioned, we went to predictive is um, almost reducing or almost eliminating uh, unscheduled downtime uh, from the equipment uh, system failures. And here, system is another byproduct, which I'll talk later, but a lot of equipments are more than one component, but it's a full system. Uh, increase uh, label utilization. So that's another thing. So for example, if a truck down has broken, then obviously you don't, you're not using your driver anymore. Reduce maintenance costs uh, again. And this, I'll talk more in business facts, but it's not just uh, when the breakdown, it's not just the cost of the change of the component. There's more costs on downtime. Increase equipment lifespan, uh, again, so if you see a degradation, you can change of the component that can affect another component. That's another thing that you think about. Uh, and also we can sell it as a business opportunity. You can sell it uh, because you already have, for example, with our fleet, we can sell it in the retrofit and other trucks and tailor fit on cost benefit on sales as well. So that's why we have this kind of um, uh, graphs that we show uh, machine learning detection, the process of degradation, and then as it degrades, then uh, offset process and the failure. So you can continue this condition monitoring tool, but then on top of that, have predictive. So this is always continuation of asset performance is high. So this is a curve that you can always remember on this, why we do predictive. And then in Volvo uh, context, uh, if, uh, I am part of the aftermarket of the Volvo. So I have been, as uh, Matt have mentioned, I've been in different journeys. I have been a specialist, tech lead, product owner, and even manager, group manager as well. And this is where I have uh, encountered this business facts that why we're we doing. And so predictive is one of the main AMT value creation parts. 
So it's a, we create maintenance effectiveness, maintenance efficiency, and surface market business development. So this is part of our journey, and that's what Volvo is really pushing. And another idea is Volvo is pushing to sell uh, not just trucks, but actually transport solutions. That means we're trying to take over the, the maintenance and everything parts of that, and we just give the availability of the transport solution to our customers. And that obviously really increases that uh, increase by you know by having a predictive because then the cost uh, we have a bigger cost ourselves that we take over as well and uh, also uh, here workshop autonomy is another thing that it can be connected to the condition monitoring of the vehicles as well and uh, so th this means we need to have a right and early decision making and that's where highlighted uh, for this role um, which helps other ones as well, uh, other parts uh, as well. Actually, you can see the parts of resource availability. If you know earlier on with, the, for example, current supply and demand prices, a crisis, if you know, for example, let's say turbocharger is going to fail within three months, you can find a turbocharger. If you're going to say, no, it's going to fail the, by, based on like a diagnostic in two days, then you might not have a turbocharger available by that time the vehicle comes. And this is another thing that we think about. And that's how the service is uh, are enabled and sold within uh, Volvo. Uh, and uh, so we have a, a part of the our company is called Truck Monitoring Center or now Vehicle Monitoring Center, and that's based in Ghent. They have a very skilled technician that uh, try to find when the vehicles are uh, in generic will break down, but that is avoid the breakdown usually within a week or so. Uh, and this is just like really, really stopping business stop edge on those trucks. However, this can be not good enough for a lot of cases as, as mentioned. So what we have, uh, our team and uh, what we predictive model we do, we try to do more than 90 days in advance of, uh, uh, find a breakdown and try to support that. And 90 days being our contract customers, we have different contracts like blue gold contracts, and they are des uh, designated to come to service every 90 days or three months uh, period. So if you obviously can predict before that period, so then uh, the customer service representative would know that this component within that truck is going to fail earlier pre prior to previous service and then can put it uh, on the next service that this component has to change. Uh, excuse me, box. Atabak. Yeah. Can you remove that box in bottom of your presentation? Share. Oh, it's short. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. I didn't notice that it was shown for you. So. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the basic, yeah, this just shows the intervals, the service intervals, the S, what it is. Uh, and then we have our solution domain from the uh, within the Volvo. So we have obviously different departments and different parts of organization work together to create it. So it's not just our team. Um, but that means we also need to kind of uh, communicate and follow all of these uh, different areas. So we have part that is creating the embedded software, data acquisition, and um, the and the components in itself, but also uh, the, uh, the sensors within components. And then from there, also TGW, that's our telematics gateway that gets the data. And then that after that is we need to be in communication with the data management or our, where the, our data are saved, uh, obtained and saved uh, to create the models. Uh, and this is, we talk about data is not just from vehicle, but vehicle service reports, any, uh, quality issues like quality journals uh, we had uh, or any um, general like market reports and costs as well. We do some of the cost calculation as well. So this is a data is a big just rather than just the vehicle data. And then the our part that we start working a lot is a data manipulation part or the part that we started creating either condition monitor alerts, we create other sometimes more um, onboard uh, models uh, or uh, data uh, obtainment techniques, or the other health management and prognostics that's where we are, that we create uh, predictive models on top of the diagnostics. So this is different than diagnostics, so it's a prognostics. Uh, we create the models 
uh, it can be either machine learning or simple statistics uh, remain useful life models basically and then after that we create a decision support on what options do we have and what should be done and then after that we have a deployment area which i'll talk later that is shows where the models are shown and deployed in the cloud and then pushed and presented as a ui ux to the end user function so this is we also need to tell them how to be shown and so on and the, one of the reasons uh, we're doing is uh, this is averaged out. So this is like including really small failures, like screw, loose and stuff that can be fixed really in, on the roadside. But still, uh, on average, on unplanned stuff and trucks is around 11,000 sec. But I'll show you this in case in some components much higher. Uh, but this is something that is for the customer. And then we have... a. Part of these customers, now 28% actually around 35, so it's much higher, and then 16% contract. So this contract now we have 50% or 50% coverage within Europe. That we the cost is now on us as well, not just customers. So this is another thing. So on blank cost will be on us as well. So this is where we need to think about the value and uh, also. Uh, not just predictive, but uh, models on um, components, but also the vehicle usage and other um, things that we do is also uh, working on like oil changes and uh, the way they work. And for example, one study we did on uh, 12,000 contract vehicles in 2016, based on predictive, uh, if uh, if we did a static, like uh, just based on normal oil drains based on their usage that we had, we should have done 67,000 oil drains. But by doing the analytics, it was 54,000 oil drains. So you reduced quite a bit of oil drains. And that was 19.5% reduction and 36 million sex savings to global trucks at that time, which was paying for within those three years contract of the oil changes. And that just shows, uh, and the cost of project was more like three million, so much lower than that. So you can see that there's a big return on investment on uh, analytics. And that was just one example of just showing the importance of analytics. However, to achieve that, as I mentioned previously, we need to work in a big, uh, so we need to work with a product owner or like the component responsible who has a knowledge of the components. So that's what I need to say. There are three circles in predictive. One area is obviously machine learning and data analytics. One area is uh, domain knowledge, which we need from product owner. And then another also circle is uh, modeling and uh, you know the software and so on, data knowledge. So those three circles you need to have. And uh, so here we need to include and understand from them. And then based on that, as I mentioned, we have the data engineering parts uh, from the communication to IoT cloud. And then we have our data scientists that look into models and then we create the microservice and widgets. So basically we have these people that we need to work to very closely in each components to be able to create a model at the end that can go to service planning tools and decision support system and basically bring value to our customer. And this is basically what customer will be able to also see the values from, we have different tools, we have triage tools, we have our Volvo optimized service planning tool. So this is Wasp, uh, for example, we work with obviously Renault trucks is also with us. They have prompt, which is similar version of that. And also they can see an app. So it is a very good widget uh, we create and uh, easy to integrate in other sources. So it's very easy, even the drivers, if they own one or few trucks, they can also follow themselves easily of that. Uh, and that's where, for example, we create, and then if you see inside trucks, then we can have all the different remaining lives and when it has to be predictive, the model's done. And if you go inside, let's say a brake pad, you can see each axle and you can see the remaining life. And you can see even the 20% that's where the warning will, pre-warning will come that uh, we need to go for a change. And then also then right before 90 days when we predict also there will be warning as well so this is the alert system now uh, a bit going more technical um in in the way we when we do predictive maintenance for components we have four kind of scenarios we have standalone components with direct measurements standalone mean very simpler components that have um, one or two or three a very simple way of measuring their health and it's usually very linear or all multilinear 
uh, fashion. So this is a little bit easier, different. Uh, so you don't need the really advanced machine learning models. However, you still need quite good machine learning, basic machine learning to statistic models to get to there, um, which I'll show some examples on that. Then we have more complex components, which are not even components, more like systems, because there are more systems, uh, components within that that can fail, or there's different failure modes, more than one failure mode. So you need to monitor, there's no direct monitoring uh, with a few um, uh, parameters, so you need to look into more advanced machine learning models with available measurements. So this is for all the components. Now, with uh, introduction of new, for number three, new uh, vehicles, like for example, we have now electromobility vehicles, new uh, trucks that are coming out, and um, generally new component changes, new models. Then we don't have enough historical data. So we don't have, uh, so then uh, it's a little bit different. We need to go more physics-based approach on that. And those components based on what we have knowledge of the components from either ourselves with test or from uh, original equipment manufacturer or OEM. And then the same one, but uh, this is if, we, if the components is direct measurements is possible. But in some cases, again, similar to case two, you have some components that are more system, but also you don't have historical data, only uh, what we have knowledge of from. OEM or ourselves from tests and from component responsible calculations and simulations. So I will start with the first case. Uh, so for standalone components and indirect measurements. So for example, we have battery packs and for batteries, we actually have a, itself is quite complex. So it's state of health and it's energy throughput. So this is very complex calculation on board the battery is done. However, luckily that's done on board. So we get values that it's much easier to monitor the health of vehicle based on other usage parameters. So we can create more multilinear uh, uh, regression models that uh, can show when the state of health of battery is going down and so on. And we can see these uh, predictions. So this is one example of a more standard direct also, in previous example, you saw uh, when I was showing the graphs, you saw brake pad. Brake pad is also similar to this. So you have a direct uh, um, brake pad thickness measurement uh, measured and sent to us uh, directly on board from, uh, and that obviously helps a very easy way of uh, creating state of health uh, graphs and predicting the remaining useful life of the component. Uh, another case, so I'm just trying to say here, that doesn't mean you can only use those direct measurements, but there's another ways. There's um, components like uh, contactors within service box, or now we call a contactor box. And the way they fail, uh, uh, it's there's based on a damage rate and current rate. So we have a, a percentage of damage added incremental. So there's a damage counting uh, parameter within onboard and here battery monitoring it. and oh sorry. And then what we do based on that, uh, we can see how many percentage of damage added. And then when obviously it gets to 100%, the contactor will remain open. And mean open, that means there will be no current coming from batteries to, to the electric machine or generally the truck. So the truck will be stand still. So that's a very important component to not fail uh, in the middle of the road, but uh, that's how the damage quantity works. And so based on that, the model is still similar to previous one, uh, but what we do based on previous scenarios, uh, it's a little bit more complex because we still need to look in the previous scenarios, what are the scenarios and the vehicle usage that come into the past damage model. And then based on the reliability distribution, we can create a kind of state of health model. It's still more linear, but still a state of health model. And you can see here in that component, for example, I had one step of damage and uh, the, the predictions are based on that. And uh, so this is another way we do uh, it's still simpler, but a little bit different than previous one. And then we have more system-based and components with lots of interdependencies uh, within it and to other components and uh, generally more than one failure mode as well. And one of the best examples that anyone working with trucks or any vehicles would know is a turbocharger. 
it's a complex component. It's connected to a lot of systems. It has connections to both uh, exhaust system and fuel system and uh, and air <laughs> system. So it's very connected uh, component. And uh, so it has a lot of interdependence itself. And itself has a lot of failure modes. Like some of the failure modes are almost opposing. Like, uh, like you have high cycle fatigue and low cycle fatigue as the name suggested, kind of opposing failure modes. So that becomes more complex. And that's where we start to looking at the uh, more data from the repair data, failures, labels, and so on. And then we start looking at much, much larger number of uh, parameters. For example, for this model, uh, though it is diagnostic object IDs, just uh, for people who are outside the vehicle or in this industry, uh, will know. Uh, but this is basically parameter received, and we're looking at 170 different parameters and 62 different variants of vehicles. So we try to enlarge in the population based on variants because trucks, unlike cars, it's very, very uh, broad variants of trucks we have and variations between them and because we sell it specific to businesses and so they're more specified. If you compare to car industry, let's compare to Rolls Royce, you can really customize it and that obviously adds more complication. But we try to use those and uh, then we, after feature selection and optimization, we create more supervised models. So here we have prior knowledge, so we create supervised models, can be classification, regression, or hybrids, or more advanced models that we can create and be working on. And uh, the reason we're doing, for example, turbocharger, I just wanted to show you back to the business fact that we had, is the cost of the average turbocharger failure, what we calculated is actually not 1100, but 36,660. And that is based on uh, when it's failed, you need to do failure analysis and diagnostic to cost that, forwarding of goods, trip to workshop, uh, repair cost, uh, because usually turbocharger failure usually costs, uh, causes other damages. And that's a very big problem. And then um, there's a total cost. And then on top of that, you need to have other cost of driver wage and so on. And it becomes quite a high cost. And if you model with eight, uh, let's say here, we have 80% recall, that model can then uh, for the population of, the, let's say we used, can save 35 and a half million sick to customers. So, so that's a, quite a big, uh, Chavin, and we have much, much, much higher than this vehicles and so on. And uh, so we can really uh, use this as a business case. Why are we going trouble of doing uh, more complex models? And then obviously when we have these models, we can uh, need to look at a lot of things. So for example, we have a lot of correlations. That's the thing, a lot of signals, uh, values that correlate. So you need to simplify those and then find a better market fits to create a more generic models and then you can then start creating a sample widget the same way and again we try to create it as a simple as possible the same way as a state of health so other even if you use classification there are ways to turn classification into a state of health graph and we do that and uh, then this is the generic what customer sees on top of that at the bottom layer you you can see where the service intervals or missed service and so on. And then when will be the pre-warning, which is the yellow one, and then warning, the red one, will achieve based on this degradation we see. And uh, this is what we have, basically. Uh, and then, obviously, on top of that, we are working a lot on CI-CD, or uh, continuous improvement components de de deployment. And we have our CI-CD pipeline on Azure. On top of that, uh, our own ways that we look at the, how we can optimize uh, models with different hyperparameter tuning, uh, feature selection, variants as inputs, more variants we can do, uh, more specific models in some cases, some populations and some failures modes sometimes. We have a failure mode very common in market. We can specify the model to that market and then get higher accuracy because of the reads. And then more new machine learning models. Uh, part of that, for example, we're working with Kaiser Plus. Uh, I don't know if we have anyone from Hampstead University here, but we work with them and we are looking into more advanced, like uh, uh, domain adversary neural network, for example, we're looking at and so on, uh, these models there. 
Then we have standalone component without historical data, and that is the problem we can have in the new components. And then that's where we need to go inside OEM information and some of the um, knowledge from the component responsible, and then try to go more like physics-based models, like Arrhenius damage model, as you can see here. And so, for example, here is a case for um, a chassis coolant pump for uh, electromobility. At then we need to look into trajectories based on test data on top of those models and try to improve the Arrhenius model. And hopefully we have good enough model to push uh, forward for the production. Obviously, it's not perfect, but we have something to still lower the uh, damage. But the thing is, the more vehicles within market, more changes coming in, or sometimes failure that we didn't detect, that will little by little, those models will turn into hybrid models. So partially data-driven, partially physical, and hopefully with enough data, they become fully data-driven in future. So that's the goal in these kind of scenarios. And the same for the ones with a more complex system base. However, you just have more steps to go. And uh, so you will have multiple uh, Arrhenius models for different uh, failure modes. So you just have more than one model in those cases. And for example, the CDC converter, we, we look at the different cases, different state of health graphs and so on. So this is just a little bit different, but it's still the same type of approach as previous one. And then uh, just to make sure that, uh, you know, our work is not just creating models, but we also observe the data achieved. And I think anyone working here with data analytics within any type of industry will know there's a data quality issues. And we also work with this and data quality issues. We have kind of a pyramid, where can it come from? And it can start all the way from the wrong readouts and unreliable readouts from the sensor data to embedded software how the readouts are done, if the correct accesses are created, the calculation model is correct and so on. And then goes to a logging part. If the, they're logged all the time, they sometimes miss logging or the logger itself has a problem to the sender has its own problems until all the way to database itself can have a lot of data quality issues. So there's a kind of pyramids of where <laughs> um, uh, uh, a qual data quality issue can appear. We can obviously monitor these, and there are different uh, uh, ways to solve, and we have implemented different solutions from different areas. And then we also have our own end solution at the end for data cleaning on removing outliers or resets and so on that you can have. On top of that, I uh, just want to briefly explain that also we not just work ourselves, we also rely on working and collaborating with other, both companies, startups, and a lot in universities. So I hope a few people from universities joined this meeting. But uh, for example, right now we have different in advanced analytics, for example, work with Hamster University, Penn State in US, and then prescriptive maintenance. When I talked about, we work with Grenoble University. We have different projects in diagnostic with Chalmers. Uh, model-based and simulation data, so for the synthetic data work, we work with TUDEL, for example, future maintenance solution, we work again with Chalmers, innovation service develop, de uh, development, so we work with the University of Lyon and Carlsberg University, and also in some component space, so one of the examples, there's more than this, but so for example, uh, for electric machines, how they fail, um, for better prediction on that specific component, we also work, for example, Dilemma Project with Lund University, and there are more than that, like I couldn't even fit here. But that just shows how much opportunities are to work with uh, other research parties and universities. And based on that, I think that's a good way to say why we also have a lot of future work that will be help needed from these parties and the universities. Uh, one of them is very big area we look into is anomaly detection on high frequency data. Uh, this is one immediate problem right now we have. We're going to have um, high frequency loggers and few vehicles that we have for electromobility. And so we can have opportunity to get rather than just periodic data uh, that are aggregated, but more direct to the CAN signals and the actual raw data. And then we can do better anomaly detection so we can actually, even the failure modes that we didn't know exist can find it. And this is where we can look into point anomalies, contextual anomalies, or collective anomalies as well. And obviously there are different ways to do that. I don't want to get, there are 
more expert people here maybe from me so uh, but there are like ways the nearest neighbor based or clustering based classification based or statistic based models they will have a lot of models underneath that we can use on unsupervised or sometimes semi-supervised because we might have some prior knowledge on the component behavior from the OEM or the component responsible. So, um, so this is something that is very important for us and we are looking into growing in that area and not just, just the sluggers that we have, we're gonna in future with the new truck architecture, electrical architecture, we will have more data, uh, high, uh, higher frequency of data collected and sent and that obviously will create even more opportunity for anomaly detections even we can do onboard anomaly detections which is another future work is edge computing and running models on board with direct uh, uh, availability of the raw signals on board as well and that is again <laughs> you'll require few anomaly detection models on board and then on top of that we need to have a good automated decision support system uh, on uh, what to do with the predictions we have. Uh, we have a lot of graphs that we send to our customer service representative who checks and see what truck has to be included in the service, but that can be a huge population of truck and a huge number of uh, the uh, graphs and components to look into. On top of that, uh, if you have in future prescriptive, that will be even more <laughs> information given to them. So that's where you need a proper automated decision support system that can help with that DSS to, um, uh, to get a better value. And then after that, uh, we need to, another thing we need to look into is a system level modeling, uh, having a new network neural of the component to component failure to failure interdependencies. So that means there's, a lot of so you need to look, look into truck as a one big system and then try to predict what each other affect each other and sometimes maybe you change more than one component so it's just help the health of the trucks and that's another a system approach that can be worked on for future and then also another thing is we based our models on previous failure uh, information and that cannot be always uh, correct and we also don't know how they fail exactly what failure mode. And that is one um, we can use test beds. For example, one of the opportunities we have remanufacturing of some of those components that we can test and um, see what was the actual, with the very quick tests, what was the problem with the components and feed that back into our models to improve our models. So these are the more future work we're looking into. So that was all my, hopefully I didn't bore you too much, uh, but thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please come back to me.